On May 19th, 2013, Yeovil Town beat Brentford 2-1 at Wembley Stadium in the League One playoff final to reach the second tier of English football for the first time in the history of the club. For Brentford, who themselves had only spent one season in the second tier since the 1950s, it proved to be merely a minor setback for the Matthew Benham revolution. The following season, they won automatic promotion, and in the 2020-21 season, the Bees moved into their brand new stadium and won promotion to the Premier League, this time winning at Wembley in the Championship playoff final. For Yeovil Town though, as manager Gary Johnson put it, the Championship was their Premier League. The Glovers had the lowest budget in League One when they won promotion to the Championship, in an achievement that could quite reasonably be likened to Leicester City's Premier League title win in 2016. The club's average attendance that season was just 4,002, the wage bill for their entire first team squad was only £1 million, and going into the season, before a ball had been kicked, Yeovil were the division's favourites to be relegated and the longest odds to win promotion. Sadly for Yeovil, who had spent more than 90% of their existence as a non-league team, that playoff final win, which was the greatest day in the history of the club, also proved to be the beginning of the end in terms of their extraordinary success. Within just two and a half years of winning on the hallowed turf of Wembley Stadium, Yeovil found themselves glued to the foot of the League 2 table, following consecutive 24th place finishes in the Championship and in League One, and in 2019, Yeovil finally lost their Football League status. To look at the rise and fall of Yeovil Town in the abstract, you might say that Yeovil is a small, fairly remote town of just 45,000 people, and that not only have Yeovil Town spent almost the entirety of their existence playing non-league football, they are the only club from Somerset ever to have played in the Football League. It is tempting, therefore, to say of Yeovil Town's rise from 2003 to 2013, really, that it was a freak event and that their demise in the near decade since, relegating Yeovil to the status of mid-table National League team, is merely the Glovers reverting to the mean. Well, that may be, but football clubs are not like the freak storms around Saturn's North Pole that science cannot yet explain. They don't just rise, fall, implode or explode without reasonable explanation. Which means that it is worth asking the question of just how Yeovil Town managed to pull off one of the most dramatic rises and catastrophic collapses in the history of English football, all in the space of barely more than a decade. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Somerset as we take a look at how Yeovil Town went from the archetypal non-league team to the Football League's greatest overachievers, and then back again in about the same amount of time as it would take you to get from Yeovil to anywhere with a population of more than 100,000 people. Although Yeovil didn't become a Football League team for the first time until 2003, for more than a century before that, they were no strangers to playing, and indeed beating, league opposition. In fact, Yeovil still hold the record for having won more games, 21 to be precise, against league opposition as a non-league team than any other club. Yeovil dumped the likes of Fulham and Blackpool out of the FA Cup in famous cup upsets, but their most notable giant killing came in 1949, when First Division Sunderland, then the richest club in Britain, got beat 2-1 at Hewish Athletic Ground, sending Yeovil into a fifth round tie against Manchester United. That match would prove to be a step too far for Yeovil, who lost 8-0 at Main Road in front of a crowd of more than 81,000 people, as Old Trafford was still undergoing reconstruction as a result of World War II bombing. Throughout this time of giant killings and Southern League titles, Yeovil had often applied to join the Football League. Prior to 1986, there was no promotional relegation between what we now call League 2 and the National League, but rather, teams would be infrequently elected to join the Football League based upon the votes of existing members. Yeovil came within a whisker of being admitted in 1976, but the year before promotion and relegation between the League and non-League games was actually introduced, Yeovil were relegated down into the Isthmian League, which was the sixth tier of English football at the time. 
It was a real blow to Yeovil, but they bounced back in 1988, and in 1990, they moved into their new home ground, Hewish Park. Whilst the club's old stadium, the Hewish Athletic Ground, better known simply as Hewish, certainly had its charms, the eight-foot slope from one sideline to the other, for which it was famous, had previously proved to be a real hurdle to Yeovil being granted admission to the Football League. With that ultimate aim in mind, Yeovil moved into the new Hewish Park, but the new stadium would entail instant results. In fact, Yeovil were relegated back down to the Isthmian League in 1995, before Tottenham legend Graham Roberts took the club back up two years later, and it was at the start of the new millennium that something special started to take place in Somerset. Colin Addison took Yeovil up to second in the conference in the 2000-2001 season, as well as reaching the third round of the FA Cup, where the Glovers were only beaten in injury time by Premier League-bound Bolton Wanderers. But he missed out on the title, and therefore promotion, by six points to Rushton and Diamonds. Addison subsequently took a job at Swansea City, at which point Yeovil appointed Gary Johnson, convincing Johnson to step down as manager of the Latvia national team. It was an appointment that would change everything for Yeovil Town. Though Yeovil were unable to win the conference title during Johnson's debut season in charge, he was able to guide the club to glory in the FA Trophy for the first time in their history. Johnson was able to instill a winning mentality in his players from that moment on, and throughout his time at Hewish Park, a player's attitude and mentality would always be as important, if not even more important to Yeovil, in terms of their recruitment. The following season, Yeovil absolutely cruised to the conference title, amassing an enormous 95 points and finishing 17 points clear of Morecambe in second. This was a team which contained several future Football League stars, most notably Gavin Williams, who joined West Ham from Yeovil in 2004 and went on to become a full Welsh international. For the first time in their history, Yeovil were a Football League club, but they very quickly made it clear that they weren't just there to make up their numbers. In their first season playing in the third division, soon to be renamed League Two, Yeovil finished above established Football League sides like Swansea City and relatively nearby Bristol Rovers, and they only missed out on the playoffs to Lincoln City by virtue of goal difference. That was a bitter pill to swallow at the end of what had been a sensational debut campaign in the Football League, but there would be nothing bitter about the season that followed. Over the summer, despite selling Gavin Williams to West Ham for roughly a quarter of a million pounds and not spending a single penny on new arrivals, Yeovil brought in some outstanding players as free agents. The most notable of them was undoubtedly Phil Jevons, who had only scored three goals on loan at Hull City the previous season, but had previously hit double figures in the third tier whilst playing for Grimsby Town. He struck a whopping 27 times in the league, and 29 times in all competitions, to fire Yeovil to the League 2 title in its inaugural season under that name. Exhilarating to watch, Yeovil actually conceded more goals that season than last-placed Cambridge United, despite winning the title, by virtue of the fact that they scored 90 goals. This was champagne football, at least by the standards of League 2, and a record average of 6,320 fans flocked to see the Glovers make history in such emphatic style, the fourth highest average attendance in League Two that season. The remarkable work that Gary Johnson had done at Yeovil Town had not gone unnoticed though, and when the Bristol City board lost patience with manager Brian Tinian at the beginning of the 2005-06 season, they appointed Johnson as his successor. There would be more disruption midway through Yeovil's first season playing in League One, as the club was sold by John Goddard Watts to David Webb shortly before Christmas. Webb, a former professional footballer himself, best known for the six years that he spent as a regular starter at Chelsea, had actually briefly managed Yeovil in the year 2000, and he appointed himself as the club's new chief executive. His time in the job would be very short-lived, lasting just two months, but despite all of the turmoil off the pitch, Yeovil gave a solid account of themselves in League One under Gary Johnson's former assistant, Steve Thompson, who was entrusted with the top job in his absence, finishing 15th in League One. 
Thompson was still replaced over the summer by Russell Slade, who had just lost a playoff final at Grimsby Town, and the 2006-07 season would be the most emphatic illustration yet of how far Yeovil Town had come. Just three points separated Yeovil and two-time European champions Nottingham Forest at the end of the season, which meant that the two teams met in the playoff semi-finals, bidding for a place in the championship. Despite losing 2-0 in the first leg at home, Yeovil staged a stunning comeback at the city ground in the second leg, winning 5-4 in aggregate and 5-2 on the night. And though they were unable to secure promotion to the championship, losing 2-0 at Wembley to Blackpool in the playoff final, these were halcyon days for Yeovil Town supporters. It was also the second season in a row which heralded a change of ownership at Yeovil Town as John Fry acquired David Webb's shares in the club. The following season, whilst Yeovil fell to an 18th place finish in League One, their former boss Gary Johnson also lost a playoff final, the championship playoff final in his case, at Bristol City. Johnson's time in Bristol came to an end in 2010, and following brief stints with both Peterborough United and Northampton Town, he made his homecoming with Yeovil in 2012. He joined a club that had finished in the bottom half of the League One table for five successive seasons after reaching the playoffs in 2006-07, and though consolidation at League One level was actually pretty good going given Yeovil's size and budget, Johnson only ever aimed high at Hewish Park. Over the summer, the Glovers did some fantastic work in the loan market, once again, without spending a single penny, and Irish centre-forward Paddy Madden would become Johnson's new Phil Jevons. Madden had scored just two goals in 36 games for Oldham Athletic, since arriving in English football from Bohemians, hence why he set Yeovil back just £15,000 when they made his loan move a permanent but he proved to be an inspired signing that typified the type of character that Johnson wanted at the club, his ability to extract the absolute best out of players, and the gems that Yeovil were still able to unearth whilst operating on a shoestring budget. Madden was the league's top scorer with 23 goals in his debut campaign as Yeovil returned to the playoffs, and this time they would experience the feeling of winning at Wembley after beating another comparative giant in the form of Sheffield United in the semi-finals, before holding firm to prevent a brilliant footballing side in Brentford in the final. The championship was the promised land as far as Yeovil Town were concerned. From the Isthmian League, English football's sixth tier, as recently as 1997, Yeovil were now just one division below the Premier League, and would be playing teams like Derby County, Leeds United, and Sheffield Wednesday, who previously they would have targeted as giant killings in the FA Cup, on a level footing. Yet, in some respects, promotion to the championship, the greatest achievement in the history of Yeovil Town Football Club, would be the beginning of the end for English football's greatest underdogs. Or, at least, that was the case in the eyes of then-chairman John Fry. As far as Fry is concerned, it was the investment required following promotion and the shortfall that the club then had when they were relegated from the championship that led to their rapid demise. That might seem like a curious assessment to some people, perhaps even to some Yeovil Town fans, given that the club, once again, didn't actually spend a penny on new signings following promotion to the second tier of English football. Whilst huge fees were being forked out by almost all of those around them, Yeovil signed six players on free transfers and brought 13 players in on loan, including the likes of Shane Duffy, Wayne Hennessy, and John Lundstrom. And that was just in the summer window alone. Nonetheless, according to Fry, the rising costs and wage bill meant that relegation left the club in need of a fire sale to clear their top earners. When a team is relegated from the Premier League, parachute payments exist to soften the blow of the tremendous gap between Premier League and Championship revenues. No such system exists for when a team is relegated from the Championship, but for Yeovil Town, given the size of the club and their attendances, that gap felt almost as large. One of the club's most significant costs following promotion was the creation of an academy system. When they won promotion from League One, the Glovers didn't even have a youth or a reserve team, hence why that was prioritised ahead of new signings. It should be said that, despite Yeovil being so widely tipped to be relegated that season that, 
some fans joked of predictions that they would finish 25th out of 24 teams in the championship, they actually held their own for the most part. They did still finish last, but Johnson's men beat the likes of Watford and Nottingham Forest, they were taunts just once all season away at Huddersfield Town, and they only finished seven points off survival. Nonetheless, relegation it was, and over the summer, several first-team stalwarts had to be sold, in addition to the club losing all of those low knees that had formed the backbone of their team in the championship. In effect, Yeovil was starting from square one all over again, and for once, with his hands tied behind his back, Gary Johnson and his recruitment team were unable to rebuild the club's squad. It was a painful experience for Yeovil fans when Johnson was sacked by Fry in the February of the following season, particularly given that Yeovil's results got even worse under his successor, Terry Skyverton, who spent 11 years as a player at Hewish Park, four of them playing under Johnson. Rooted to the foot of the League One table, from February until the end of the season, Yeovil were relegated in last place for a second successive campaign, and as they plummeted down into the League Two relegation zone, right at the start of the 2015-16 season, under Paul Sturrock, it felt like their remarkable rise over the past decade had been almost instantly undone. Yeovil survived that season, but only just, marking the first of three seasons in which the club stayed in the Football League only by the skin of their teeth. In December 2015, another club legend, Darren Way, replaced Paul Sturrock as first-team boss. In November 2018, three years later, Way was awarded with a new extended three-year deal for having kept Yeovil in the Football League, but immediately after he signed that deal, the Glovers lost their next four games on the bounce. At a Supporters' Alliance meeting during this poor run of form, Way is alleged to have stormed in and claimed that he was a hero, he could walk into any other club, and that he wouldn't be at Yeovil Town forever, and that when he left, he would be sorely missed. He also allegedly claimed that Yeovil fans knew nothing about football. Way certainly wouldn't be at Yeovil forever, he was right about that. In fact, he wouldn't even be there for another three months, but his sacking and his replacement by Darren Saal did nothing to prevent Yeovil's 16-year Football League status from coming to an end. Way, it should be noted, despite claiming that he could walk into any other club, has not yet been appointed by either Bayern Munich or Barcelona, presumably because he turned them both down, in favour of taking a job as Portsmouth Under-18's boss in 2020, where he still works. In September 2019, Norman Hayward and John Fry relinquished their control of Yeovil Town, selling the club to Errol Pope and Scott Priestnell. Little was known about the two men at the time, other than the fact that they had bought a rugby club together in 2018, but Pope was thought to be the financial clout behind the duo. That made it a little concerning for Yeovil fans in December 2020, when Pope stepped down, leaving Priestnell in charge on his own. To make matters worse for Yeovil fans, before Pope and Priestnell took over, Yeovil had been on the verge of being sold to Rob Kuig Jr., with the takeover supposedly only requiring sign-off and EFL approval. That was just before Yeovil were relegated from League 2, but despite all parties insisting that the deal was not dependent upon Yeovil Town retaining their Football League status, for some reason, the takeover collapsed. Kuig supposedly confirmed that relegation had nothing to do with the deal breaking down, though. He didn't actually state what the real reason was, leaving supporters rather bemused. After Kuig's attempts to buy Yeovil fell through, he bought Wickham Wanderers instead, with whom he won promotion to the Championship in his debut campaign. The Chairboys are now back in League One, but they did reach the playoff final last season, losing to Sunderland, and they hope to challenge for the playoffs once again this season. For Yeovil fans, it is the footballing equivalent of Bullseye's, now here's what you could have won. Instead, Glover's fans have endured what can only be described as a fractured relationship with Scott Priestnell ever since he arrived, and I am sugarcoating things by using that term. Priestnell accuses what he calls a small section of Yeovil fans of holding the club back and preventing a sale, whilst claiming that he is doing a fantastic job. Supporters claim that it is Priestnell who is preventing viable sales, meanwhile the current Yeovil owner 
previously claimed supporters had put the club up for sale without his permission. And he took aim at the Glover's Trust, who held talks with prospective buyers in the hope of getting a takeover to be completed. Priestnell rejects the suggestion, put forward by some Yeovil fans, that he acquired Yeovil Town with the intention of asset stripping the club, or of profiteering, through the development of land around the ground. Matters are somewhat further complicated by the recent revelation, as has been shared by the Glover's Trust, that Stuart Robbins, who was appointed to the Yeovil Town board in May 2022, now owns 20% of the club. How much Robbins paid to acquire his 20% stake in the Glovers is, as yet, unclear. It has been a rough eight years for Yeovil Town, following the most extraordinary 10 or 11 year period in the entire history of the club. In addition to their plight of three relegations, losing their Football League status, and finishing as low as 16th in the National League, the football club, and the football community more broadly, was rocked by the news of Yeovil captain Lee Collins' death in March 2021, aged only 32. A committed and driven centre-back who wore his heart on his sleeve, Collins was found dead in his hotel room, having taken his own life. Yeovil are still reeling from that tragedy, whilst anger and mistrust towards the club's current ownership regime persists. The National League is an incredibly competitive division, with just one automatic promotion place, and several large former football league teams and a handful of clubs being backed by very wealthy benefactors. Yeovil are neither a massive club, nor are they backed by a wealthy benefactor, but they are a club capable of competing in the football league, as they have illustrated. Their ground, passion, and catchment area dictates that they are capable of returning to the football league, but it might just take a suitably ambitious owner and boardroom to bring the glory days back to Hewish Park. Until then, Yeovil Town face Woking next weekend, who poached their manager Darren Sahl over the summer, in a reminder of just how far the Glovers have fallen since their days in the championship just eight years ago. So that is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed, of course, and have notifications turned on, as HITC7s closes in rather rapidly on the milestone of half a million subscribers. Let's, let's smash through that barrier and then, you know, straight to a million after that. You can also find me on social media on either Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Have a stellar day.